I'd like to say welcome, everyone. This is Brother Anthony Flunder with the Church of Christ in Manhattan Heights in Lubbock, Texas, co-host of the Nationwide Gospel Call. Tonight from Dallas, Texas, our speaker is Brother Leonard Graves. Brother Graves will be speaking on the topic tonight, the power of forgiveness, from Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 32. So at this time, I present to you Brother Leonard Graves. Good evening, Brother Flanda, and I again want to thank you for the invitation to speak tonight. Uh, again, the topic that I have is the power of forgiveness, and that's something we can all use in our lives. As that's been the issue with many, many families and, and on this call. But on October 26, 2018, the church lost a brother in Christ. We lost a friend. His name was Botham John. He was sitting at home on his couch eating ice cream when he was murdered by police officer Amber Geiger. Now, Bolton's family had a choice to make on whether to seek vengeance or to forgive the murderer of their dear family member. Now, the world was offering advice to not forgive, but to let's see what the Bible says when it comes to matters of forgiveness. The, 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 the topic tonight I have, again, is the power of forgiveness in the Scripture. It's Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. Again, that's Ephesians 4, verses 31 and 32. And the Bible reads, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. So when someone does something to you, do you choose to forgive? I know there are times when even saints have a problem with forgiveness. And Webster describes forgiveness as the intentional and voluntary process by which a victim undergoes a change in feeling or attitude regarding an offense and overcomes the negative emotions such as resentment and vengeance. While we can't control what others do to us, we can decide our own actions. So tonight, I want to discuss the importance of forgiveness on our lives right now and the importance of forgiveness on our eternal life. So many people today hold on to too much bitterness and anger far too long. But in this life, we must learn to let it go so we can grow. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. What matters is our response and what we're going to do now going forward. See, Joseph was sold into slavery by his own brothers because they were jealous of him, according to Genesis 37 and 28. See, Joseph had a decision to make, though, whether to hold on to the bitterness and anger that would surely come with someone settling into slavery, or he had a choice to forgive them for what they did. The years later, Joseph was placed in position to save or slaughter his brother. His brothers experienced a famine in Israel and had to go to Egypt, where Joseph was now second in command of everything. And there was a number of things that could have happened. Joseph could have had him in prison. Joseph could have had him executed. But Joseph did not have a vengeful heart. Despite the circumstances, Joseph decided to forgive. And we can find that in Genesis 50, verses 20 and 21. Again, that's Genesis 50, verses 20 and 21. And the Bible reads, As for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as to this day, to save much people alive. And therefore, fear you not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. See, he could have killed them, but instead he spake kindly to them. See, God turned the evil conspiracy against him to good to glorify his name. See, the people of Israel could have all died off, uh, but God used the conspiracy against Joseph to save them. See, Joseph was now in place to give them the resources they needed. So when your brothers conspire against you, I want you to remember that God can turn that into something good. Always consider the bigger picture and how God is working in our lives. And I know there are times when it's really hard and challenging to forgive others for what they've done. I'm here to tell you, folks, do it anyway. I'm sure it was challenging for Joseph to, after being sold into slavery to forgive his brother. But he did it, and he ended up causing saving a whole lot of lives. 
Go to Colossians 3 and verse number 13. Again, that's Colossians 3, verse number 13. Because although it's challenging at times to forgive others, this is something that we have to start doing. The Bible implores us to do so. Colossians 3 and 13 says, For bearing with one another, forgiving one another, if any has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. See, God turned a bad incident of a famine into a glorious victory for his people. And he can do the same for your life today. See, when Botham died, the incident was a bad incident turned into good. Because Brent, Botham's brother, expressed interest in wanting his brother's killer to be saved. He said, I don't want any ill will toward her. I want her to be a part of the body of Christ, the church of Christ. See, many wanted her to be put to death, the death penalty and all this other stuff. But while the family of saints wanted her to be saved, in fact, during the trial, Brent did the unthinkable. He asked the judge if he can hug the murderer of his brother. But that's the kind of love that you have to have. That's the kind of forgiveness that Christ expects from us. Now, that was a peculiar thing to many people. Many people thought that was strange. Just as strange as Joseph blessing those who enslaved him. But just as First Peter 2 and 9 lets us know, the Lord's people are a peculiar people. This is the kind of forgiveness that is found in the Lord and his church. See, the church was glorified through the incident, and his mother mentioned many times how she raised her sons in the church and always raised her sons to forgive. See, forgiving is not just for the person you forgive. It's also for your inner peace. Brent and the family show the world what Christian forgiveness looks like. Now, many who have never heard of the Church of Christ know about the Church of Christ today because of the kind act shown by Brent. See, more people across the world know the love of Christ because of this incident. See, although it was a bad incident, it also shined a glorious light on the church. See, forgiveness can shine a glorious light on God's children. That's why we must learn to forgive. I'm sure many of us on this call, we commit sins many times and expect God's forgiveness each and every time. We have to have that same level of mercy and grace when it comes to others. In fact, Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, again, that's Matthew 6, verse 14 and 15, the Bible reads, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But... If you forgive men not their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. I don't know about you, friends, but I need God's forgiveness for all the sins I've committed in my life, and so do you. So some of us are holding on to issues 20 and 30 years ago. But remember, you too are flawed. You too have done some things I'm sure you wish you could take back. Everybody under the sound of my voice have done something in their life they wish they could take back. In fact, how many times have you sinned in your life? None of us on this call can even count how many times we've sinned. Yet we expect God's forgiveness each time we ask for it. But yet let one person do one thing to us, and some of us are just done with that person. That's not godly forgiveness. That's not godly love. If they ask, we must. Let me say it again. If they ask, we must forgive. Luke 17, 3 and 4 says, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother transgress against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. If he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day again say, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. It doesn't matter the offense, the amount of offenses, the degree of the offense. Some of us like to count how many times somebody did something to us. What if Jesus counted us the same way and counted how many times we committed sin? We have to learn to have that same level of grace and mercy that we are shown by Christ. We should do our best to reconcile, especially if you're dealing with a member of the body of Christ. Because if you're a member of the body of Christ, he gave us a procedure 
to make sure that we reconcile with each other. And it's found in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. Again, that's Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. And the Bible reads, Moreover, if thy brother shall transgress against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he should hear thee, thou hast gained a brother. So the first step is telling you to do is when you have a problem with somebody in the church is to go to that brother. Then it said once you go to him and y'all can't resolve it that way, then it says take two or three more that the mouth of two or three witnesses that every word will be established. So the first step you do is you go to him individually. If it can't be resolved then, then you go back with a couple of more brothers. But then the Bible says if he neglects to hear them, Tell it to the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let it be unto him as a heathen man and as a publican. See, if we follow God's plan, then we can always be in good standing with him. These verses show us, though, that we must give them a chance despite the circumstance. Give them a chance to reconcile back with us. But we have to learn to have a pure mindset like a child. I remember when I was a child, me and my cousin, Roger, we could fight, uh, and five minutes later, we best friends playing basketball together. And that's the kind of childlike forgiveness that God expects all of us to have. See, children can fight and do those, and, and, and again, five minutes later, they're best friends, and that's what we all need to be. Matthew 18 and 3 says, and, and verily I say unto you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, we've all seen children get into a drag them out fight, and five minutes later, they're best friends. I'm here to tell you, Saint, that's the kind of love that God wants us to have, the kind of childlike forgiveness that we are expected to display. See, the family of both of them decided to forgive, and now guess what? They are able to sleep and rest. They're able to move on with their life. They're able to know that their loved one is in a better place. Now they can focus on pleasing God. See, forgiveness is good for us in life. According to 1 John 1 and 9, the Bible says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that cleansing, y'all, is so needed because all of us, have sinned, and since we have sinned, we should definitely understand that we need God's forgiveness, so it shouldn't be no problem with us forgiving the man, knowing how much we need God's forgiveness. See, some of us may say, well, I've never done anything to anybody. Well, you did something against God, you have sinned. And Isaiah 64 and 6 says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our unrighteousness are filthy as rags. He compares their righteousness to being filthy rags. And he said, we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. So I don't want anyone on this call tonight to be on the high horse, because everyone on this call has fallen short of God's glory. Romans 3.23 said, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And due to our sin, Jesus came. Jesus died. And I'm going to get into a little bit more later, but that ties to our salvation. So if we ask, he is just to forgive us, and I'm telling you all, it's so important for our families today and for the church. Many families and many congregations have been torn apart because people have failed to forgive each other. But failing to forgive can hold all of us back from reaching our best life in the Lord. See, some will suffer from not being able to sleep. Some will suffer from alcohol abuse. Some will develop pent-up stress, all because they have not learned to forgive. It can impact your body. It can also impact your soul. We must learn to forgive others if we want God's forgiveness. In addition to forgiving yourself, what I found throughout the years is I have many people that, that would not forgive their self for things they did many, many years ago. But I'm here to tell you, I don't care what you've done in the past. Remember, you are worthy to serve God 
if you learn to let it go so you can grow. We all have a past, but do not let your past determine your future. See, the prodigal son had this very problem. He was letting his past associations determine his future. As long as he stayed around his worldly friends, the best thought he had was to eat some pig slop. That's the advice that they gave him. But he had prostitutes. He had gambled and lost all his living. He lived a life of debauchery. But yet, even though he did all those things, he was able to come to his senses and forgive himself. And he was able to move on to go back to his father and truly live his best life. But he thought he was living a good life and sin. He didn't realize what the life he had with his father. And I'm sure many on this call tonight may think they're living a good life away from the father. You can live your very best life with him, but you first got to learn to forgive yourself because whatever you've done, God will forgive you. He wants you to be his son. The Bible says in Luke 15, 18 and 9, see, the prodigal son had went away from his father, but he finally came to his senses. And the Bible says in Luke uh, 15, again, 18 and 19, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as thy high servant. The prodigal son felt like a lot of us on this call tonight. He felt unworthy. But his father was glad when he came back home. He was ready to forgive him, giving the very best of things he ever had, the best cow, the best of everything. He wasn't sitting there waiting and complaining. He was happy that he came back home. And the Lord will be happy once a lot of us come back home. So let's not forget that. A lot of the Lord's people had some questionable background. Think about Abraham. Abraham was a liar. He lied and said his wife was his sister. David was a man that killed another man to have sexual relations with his wife. Yet both of these men proved to be faithful servants of God once they repented. Paul and Saul, one of the greatest gospel writers, but he started all persecuting the church. See, it don't matter what you've done in the past, Learn to let it go so you can move on with your life. See, the father of the prodigal son was so happy upon his return. Luke 15 and verse number 20. The Bible says that he arose and came to his father. But when he went a great far off, his father saw him. He had compassion and ran and fell upon his neck, and he kissed him. See, God is waiting so for so many of us on this call tonight that just want to come back. He has his arms wide open, just waiting for you to make the decision. So forgiveness is good for others. It's good to forgive yourself, and it's good for your life right now. But it's also good for our eternal life. Luke 6 and 34 says, Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. See, what if God treated us with a lack of forgiveness? If he was just waiting to pounce on us when we made any mistake and just cast us down when we did so, none of us would be on this call tonight. But the fact that God loved us while we were yet sinners, giving us a chance after chance after chance to get it right, we should treat others as God treats us with many chances. We should have a repentant heart ready to forgive as God's example. See, our sin made God have to create a plan to reconcile us back to him because God is holy and he can't dwell in sin. So since he can't dwell in sin, God created a way before the foundation of the world to be completed at the cross. In First Peter 1, verses 19 and 20, the Bible said, But with the precious blood of Christ, and as a lamb without blemish or without spot, who was verily forly ordained, before the foundation of the world, but was manifesting to you for these last times. Imagine Jesus giving up all the things he gave up to be here with us, giving up the glory of heaven to come down on earth to suffer a cruel death so for you and I can exercise that power of forgiveness. See, Jesus could have been even angered on the cross 
But yet, even on the cross, Jesus had the mindset of forgiveness. In Luke 23 and 34, Jesus' mindset was not, well, kill them all, Father, they have me on this cross. He said, Jesus said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and passed lot. I wanted to understand how powerful this act was. He was sinless, yet the one being crucified. He was crucified for the remission of our sins. 1 Corinthians 15 and 3 says, For I was delivered unto you, first of all, which I have also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. See, Jesus was not only forgiving them on the cross for murdering him, he was also offering eternal salvation, the only kind that he could provide. The Bible says in Hebrews 10 and 4, For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sins of the world. See, we needed the pure blood of Jesus, his sustaining blood. Like we often think about blood as something that we got on our shirt. It would be hard to clean up. But Jesus' blood just just the opposite. It actually cleanses us from all sin. In fact, uh, Colossians 1 and 20 says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The man had a sin problem that required forgiveness. According to Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, sin was a barrier between God and man. To solve this problem, Jesus was the answer. Jesus came to accomplish forgiveness of sin for the entire world. This was not only for those in that day, but it's also available to you today. To consider all that Jesus done to save us. Consider the cruelty that he suffered at the cross. See, Truman Davis, a medical doctor, described the torture that Jesus endured at the cross. I want you to pay attention right here to what I'm about to say, because what I'm about to say is the actual events of what happened to our Lord and Savior, the pain that he endured so we could access forgiveness. The prisoner is stripped of his clothing. His hands are tied to a post above his head. The Roman legionnaire steps forward with a flagrum in his hand. See, a flagrum is a small whip consisting of several heavy leather thrones with, with two small balls of lead on the end of each. And then there's a heavy whip used to bring down full force across the back, the legs, the arms, and the shoulders of Jesus. The soldier was going back and forth, up and down, bleeding Jesus eventually. His arms and his shoulders suffered much, much pain. But as the first cut hit, it cut through the skin only. But as the blows continue, deeper and deeper, producing the first sight of oozing blood from the veins and underlying muscles, the small balls produce large, deep bruises, which then are followed by more blows. Finally, the skin of Jesus' back is hanging like long ribbons. This fulfills the prophecy of Psalm 129 and 3. For the Bible reads, the plow was plowed by back. They made my furrows long. I want you to truly imagine this. I'm sure many of you on this call have used a meat grinder before. Anytime you use a meat grinder, when you go down and up on that meat grinder, oftentimes there's usually meat hanging off that meat grinder. And that's the same thing that our Father, our Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, our Savior, went through. He had meat off a grinder. His body looked like meat hanging off a meat grinder uh, just because it was on that flagrum. Every time they went up and every time they went down, it was more and more meat coming off that flagrum. Now, the weakened Jesus was now exhausted. Then he was led to his place of crucifixion. The death by crucifixion was the most disgraceful, the most violent, the most painful manner of execution by the Romans. The doctor goes on to say that Jesus was thrown backwards and his shoulders against the wood. The legionnaire feels with depression at the front of his wrist. He drove a heavy, 
where wrap our nails through the wrist and deep into the wood. Quickly, he does the other wrist and repeats this same action. The left foot is placed backwards against the right foot with both feet extended toes down. A nail is driven through the arch of each foot. The victim is now crucified. And Jesus slowly sags down with more weight. Fiery pain shoots along through his fingers and his arms. Nails in his wrist place, place pressure on his medium nerve. And as he attempts to avoid all that pain, he tries to pull himself up. But the sweeping cramps and the fatigue and the throbbing pain does not allow him to do so. He cannot receive the life-saving oxygen he so surely needs. Hours of limitless pain, joint rendering cramps, partial asphyxiation as he moves up and down on that cross. Another agony begins as the crushing deep pain in his chest from the serum as it begins to compress his heart. It's almost over. The loss of teacher tissue has reached critical levels. The heart is struggling to pump heavy, sluggish blood into his tissue. The tortured lungs are making a frantic attempt to gasp for small gulps of air. The blood finally fills his lungs. It is finished. Our Savior is crucified. After six long, cruel hours, he suffered on that cross. And the fact that he died and he was buried and resurrected is why we have an opportunity to be saved today. So we can't access, though, this this safety without being in Christ. You can't access the forgiveness that's in Christ unless you get in Christ. And we can find out how we get in Christ by obeying the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. But the Bible says that he died. See, the old man and woman and you must die to sin, leaving that old lifestyle behind. Realizing that you must forgive others and look to God for your instruction going forward. Jesus, the Bible says Jesus was buried. You too must be buried if you want to be saved. Romans 6, 3 and 4 says, Know you not that as many of you were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, therefore we are buried with him, were baptized into his death. Like Christ was raised up from the bodies of the glory of the Father, even so should we walk in the newness of life. So he was resurrected, and we too must be resurrected in the new life. See, many people always say, I wish I could do it all over again. Well, you can today in Christ. You can start a new life in him, in his kingdom, in his spiritual body, which is the church. Perhaps you had a life like Joseph. You had hate in your own family. Perhaps you experienced a murderer, just like the family of Otham. Perhaps you had people in your own family conspire against you like Joseph did. It doesn't matter what you experience. Ultimately, it comes down to one question. Are you willing to forgive to access God's forgiveness? You need to learn to let it go so you can grow. Forgiveness can be had and offered through the blood of Jesus, through the cross, in Christ's church. Remember, forgiveness is good for the soul and is good for you today. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, you can't access this forgiveness. This is only for those that are in him. So you're asking, Brother Graves, how can I get in him? The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God. You must believe that he's the son of God, that he died that cruel death just for you or not, according to John 8 and 24. And then you must be willing to repent, Luke 13 to 3, means you must change your mind on what you think about forgiveness, change your mind on what you think about sin, and live your life for God. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, that you must confess him before men so he can confess you before God. And then last but not least, you must be in him. Galatians 3, 27 says, for as many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Put on Christ today so you can access the power of forgiveness provided at the Christ, at the cross, so you can live your best life right now and have eternal life. I'm going to pass it back over to Brother, Brother Flander. I hope I said something to help you. 
Uh, baptism is so urgent. If you have, if you need to try to do it tonight. Don't wait another night. Do it tonight. As the night that God is calling you right now. 